This is Audible. Hard Bitten, a Chicago Land Vampires novel, by Chloe Neal. Chapter Fourteen: The Bucket List. As dawn neared, the rest of the vampires began emerging from the bar. Stumbling a little amid the strobe-like lights of the police cruisers and the snap of camera flashes, they were covered in bruises that were already green, the result of the speedy vampire healing process. I bet the community wounds would take longer to heal. Unfortunately, my grandfather and catcher talked to the cops, probably sharing notes and theories. Jeff eventually carried the laptop into the bar, probably to find out what he could about the security tapes. When the police removed their tape and the cruisers began to depart, I headed to the spot where Lindsay and the unaffected vamps were waiting. She stood up as I approached. Do you know anything? Not yet. Crime scenes apparently involve a lot of waiting and standing around. You? Lindsay glanced back at the vamps, who looked shell-shocked by the combined drama of cops, detectives, rainbow alcohol, and paparazzi. Nothing yet. I heard from one of the EMTs that your grandfather brought in a counselor to talk to the humans. It was a bar fight. I grumbled. The humans were certainly entitled to their feelings, but none of them had actually been injured. They hadn't even really been involved. But it was a bar fight with crazy, scary vampires. She exaggeratedly said, wiggling her fingers like a menacing monster. I humped, but recognized it wasn't an argument I was going to win. Not when humans were surrounded by reporters and cameras. I glanced back at the bar. Maybe we should head back inside, clean up a little. Do you want to round up the troops? God, yes, please. Luke wanted us to stay put until the cops gave us the all clear. So I've been here and bored. I'm going to consider your request the all clear. That rationalization worked for me. Give me a minute head start. I want to take a look around. She nodded, so I headed back inside. The floor of the bar was in shambles, not unlike Cadogan after the shifter attack, albeit with more casual decor. The Cubs memorabilia, thankfully, made it through the onslaught, although the tables and chairs were mostly upended. I scanned the room for anything that might give me a clue as to why our vamps were losing it, but assumed anything that would have helped had long since been picked up by the cops, and there was no short man with rave invites to be found. If Selina was involved and she was somehow leading the vampire mass hysteria, she'd managed to get us kicked out of our own bar. It was just the kind of thing she'd have enjoyed. As I stood there alone. I imagined Selina popping up from behind the bar, awash in balloons, arms raised in victory. Ah, the power of fantasy! I murmured and began picking up overturned bar tables. Lindsay came through the door, her flock of vampires behind her. All right, boys and girls, she said. Let's get this place back into fighting shape, so to speak. The vampires grumbled but obeyed, riding chairs and tables. Colin groaned as he walked back through the door. As he surveyed his place, he glanced over at me. "You gonna figure this out?" "I'm working on it," I assured him. "And speaking of, I need one more favor. I don't suppose you can whistle." He put two fingers in his mouth and let out a high-pitched trill. It only took a moment before I had the attention of all the vampires in the bar. "Discretion is the better part of valor," I said. So I'm going in the back office. If anybody's got information, this would be a good time to come talk to me. Like an irritated elementary school teacher, I stared them down until I began to see a few sheepish expressions crossing their faces. This probably wasn't going to do anything for my popularity, but it needed to be done. Playing social chair was secondary to playing sentinel and actually keeping the house intact. I glanced over at Colin and held out a hand until he offered up the office keys. When I had them in hand, I headed back for the office. I unlocked it and moved immediately to the file cabinet. I could use a drink, and I didn't think he'd mind if I sampled his flask. I popped open the top drawer, pulled out the flask, and gave the contents a warning sniff. My nose wrinkled, 
Whatever was in his secret mix, it smelled pickled. I squeezed my eyes shut and took a sip. It was not that bad, actually. It wasn't a taste I could easily describe. Pickled came closest. But there was also the tang of blood and a sweet edge that balanced out the taste. Not unlike raspberry vinaigrette. Of course, I didn't want to drink down raspberry vinaigrette. So I put the cap back on and promised myself an extra mallow cake when I finally made it home. I noticed her in the doorway just as I closed the file cabinet again. She was a vamp I'd seen around the house, but didn't really know. A cute brunette with long, wavy hair and a curvy figure. She looked right and left down the hallway, as if afraid she might be seen darkening the teacher's door. You can shut the door if you want, I told her. She stepped inside and closed the door behind her. I'm Adriana, she said. I'm on the third floor of the house. Nice to meet you. She got right to the point. I don't like playing tattletale, but I'm loyal to my house and I'm loyal to Ethan. There was no doubting the ferociousness of that affection in her gaze. And someone threatens that or the house. It's time to speak up. I nodded solemnly. I'm listening. I saw it the first time a few weeks ago. I was at a party, no humans, and a gray house vamp was using it. He tried it, and twenty minutes later he was pounding someone he said had made a pass at his girl. Adriana paused, seemed to gather her courage, and then looked up at me again. And then tonight, I found this in the bathroom. She held out a clenched fist, and then opened her fingers. In her palm sat a small white envelope with a V inscribed on the front. I didn't need to look inside to know what it would hold. I squeezed my eyes shut, irritated with my own stupidity. The drugs hadn't been for the humans. They hadn't been used to make humans more biddable. That was just good old-fashioned glamour. They were for the vampires. It wasn't the spill of magic or a virus or some sort of mass hysteria that was making them aggressive. It was a drug they'd apparently been stupid enough to take. Maybe it weakened their inhibitions toward violence. Maybe it increased their testosterone. Whatever the chemistry, this was the reason the vamps at the rave had been willing to fight over my stumbling. The reason the vamps at the bar were fighting over rainbow booze. And probably the reason why Mayor Tate thought three humans had been killed in West Town. Thanks, I said, opening my eyes again and holding out my hand. She handed over the drugs. If it's any consolation, immortality makes some of them bored, Adriana said. So they do things, they try things that they wouldn't ordinarily try. But now it's making the rounds through Temple Bar, and I don't want to see it infiltrate the house. Excellent call. Did you ever meet the seller? I asked. She shook her head. These things move from vamp to vamp. Unless you're looking to score, which I'm not. You don't even come into contact with the seller. Another miss, but at least I'd put some information together. Someone out there was selling V to Cadogan vampires. Another someone, maybe the same someone, was soliciting humans for raves. Whoever was orchestrating it, put the two together and you had an explosive situation. Thanks for letting me know. I'll see to it that Ethan finds out about the V so we can put a stop to it but I won't tell him who told me. I could see the relief in her face, but she quickly squared her shoulders again. You find out, she said. You find out who's putting this out there, who's putting us at risk. I intend to, I promised her. By the time I made it back into the bar, the chairs and tables were right side up again. Christine was sweeping up broken glass while another member of our novitiate class held the pail for her. Colin was back behind the bar, cleaning up overturned booze and broken beer bottles. Heads turned as I walked in, vamps looking at me curiously. They probably wondered what I now knew and how much trouble they were going to be in because of it. It was a good question, because right now, on behalf of me, Ethan, the house, I was pissed. I could have been sympathetic to the brawlers when I'd imagined this was some kind of traveling hysteria. But this was something they'd chosen to do. All this trouble, the cops, the bad press we were inevitably going to receive, Tate's rampage, the raves. 
was caused because idiot vampires had decided to take drugs. They'd made a choice to wreak havoc, and I had no sympathy for that. I stalked to the bar and vaulted over it, then grabbed the rope of the giant bell that hung behind it. It was used for vampire silliness, usually to signal the start of a drinking game based on Ethan's idiosyncrasies. But now I used it to signal something more serious. I grabbed the rope and slung it back and forth until the bell peeled across the room. Then I pulled an ice bucket from a shelf and put it square in the middle of the bar. I scanned the crowd to make sure only vamps were in attendance, and when the magic checked out, I let the vitriol flow. So this is about drugs, I said, and felt a little better when some of the unaffected vampires looked surprised. At least they hadn't been using, but they were apparently the only ones. Some of you have been using, I said. I don't know why, and I'm not even sure I care. Either way, you couldn't have picked a worse time. Darius is in town, and Ethan is already in trouble. The house is on the hot seat with Tate, and this certainly isn't going to help. I let that sink in for a moment, taking in the hushed whispers and worried looks. Things are changing, I said, my tone softer. Our house has been through hell recently, and the future isn't looking much brighter. I'm not going to tell Ethan which of you were here tonight. There were looks of obvious relief around the room. But we cannot let this happen again. We cannot, I cannot, allow V into the house. Besides, since I have to tell the cops about the drugs, there's a pretty good chance everyone will be frisked before they leave. I held up the ice bucket to show them I meant business, then put it down on the bar. If you've got V on you, it goes in the bucket. I'll take it out of the bar myself and turn it over to the cops. It'll be better coming from me than all of you individually. We can't let things get worse, so for the sake of the house, do the right thing. I turned and faced the wall, giving them the privacy to make their deposits. It took a few seconds, but I finally heard footsteps and shuffling of chairs, and then the ping of a tablet or the quiet thush of an envelope hitting the side of the bucket. The sounds of conscience clearing. After a moment, Colin called my name. I think they're done, he quietly said when I glanced at him. I nodded, then looked back at the crowd. Thank you. I'll make sure he knows that you helped, that you understood your responsibilities, and you can always, always come to me if you have problems. With that said, but still feeling like a total narc, I grabbed up the bucket and headed for the door. I now knew why this was happening, knew why the raves were bigger and meaner than before. I'd hopefully been able to keep the chaos out of our house. Now I had to find the pusher and put a stop to the chaos everywhere else. I made my way outside and found my grandfather, Catcher, and Jeff. My grandfather sat at the curb, his expression somber. He stood up when I approached. I guided him behind one of the cruisers and out of the way of the paparazzi, before handing over the bucket. This is V, I said, the same stuff we saw at the Streeterville party. Apparently it spread from Benson's to Grey House to Temple Bar, where Catagon vamps were stupid enough to try it. I looked at Catcher. This is why they've been so violent. It's not the glamour or the magic. It's the drugs, he agreed with a nod. Not for humans, but for vampires. I guess you're probably right about that, my grandfather said, pulling two small, clear plastic evidence bags from the pocket of his jacket. There were pills and envelopes in each. Where did you find those? On the floor of the bar, he said. Someone must have dropped it in the confusion. Maybe the V stands for vampire or violence. Whatever you call it, Catcher said, it's bad. V is in the clubs, it's in the parties, it's in the vampires. My grandfather glanced back at the paparazzi, who were flashing pictures from behind the police tape. Their gray and black lenses zooming in and out as they tried to capture each bit of the scene. I can't keep them from taking pictures, he said, but I'll hold on to the V issue as long as possible. At this point, the drug's only targeted at vampires and there doesn't seem to be an obvious risk to humans. I appreciate that, and I'm sure Ethan does too. 
A beat cop approached my grandfather, making eyes at me as he did it. Catcher, Jeff, and I were silent as my grandfather stepped aside, chatting quietly with the officer and, when they were done, passing him the bucket. When my grandfather walked back over again, his brow furrowed. I assume nothing good was heading my way. How do you feel about coming down to the precinct and giving a statement? My stomach curled. He was doing me a favor by letting me do the talking, letting me control the house's destiny, so to speak. But that didn't mean I was crazy about the idea of going voluntarily to a police station. Not great, to be real honest. Ethan will have a fit. Not if the other option is a random Catagun vamp without your training or allegiances. We need to talk to a Catagun vamp he said, and it's better you than anyone else. I sighed. Not only was I now the bearer of bad news, I was the rat fink tasked with reporting all the dirty details to the CPD. But my grandfather was right. What better choice did we have? I nodded my agreement, blew out a breath, and pulled out my cell phone again. I might not be the bearer of good tidings, but at least I could give him a little forewarning and hope to God he wasn't waiting to strip me of my medal at the end of the night. I rode in the front seat of my grandfather's Oldsmobile, adrenaline turning to exhaustion, as we drove to the CPD's Loop Precinct. He parked in a reserved spot and escorted me into the building, a hand at my back to keep me steady. Given the task at hand, I appreciated the gesture. The building was relatively new and pretty sterile, the peeling paint and ancient metal furniture of cop dramas, replaced by cubicles and automated kiosks and shiny tile floors. It was nearly four in the morning, so the building was quiet and mostly empty but for a handful of uniformed officers moving through the halls with perps and handcuffs, a woman in a short skirt and tall boots with undeniable exhaustion in her eyes. A jittery man with gaunt cheeks and dirty jeans, and a heavy-set kid whose straight hair covered his eyes, his oversized gray T-shirt dotted with blood. It was a sad scene, a snapshot of folks having undoubtedly miserable evenings. I followed my grandfather through what looked like a bullpen for detectives, rows of identical desks and chairs filling a room bordered by a ring of offices. Detectives lifted their gazes as we passed offering nods to my grandfather and curious, or just plain suspicious, glances at me. On the other side of the bullpen, we moved down a hallway and into an interview room that held a conference table and four chairs. The room, part of the renovation, smelled like a furniture showroom, cut wood, plastic, and lemon polish. At my grandfather's gesture, I took a seat. The door opened just as he took the chair beside me. A man, tall, dark-skinned, and wearing a pinstripe suit, walked inside and closed the door. He had a yellow notepad and a pen in hand, and he wore his badge on a chain around his neck. Arthur, my grandfather said, but Arthur held out a hand before my grandfather could stand up and greeting. Don't bother on my account, Mr. Merritt, Arthur said, exchanging a handshake with my grandfather. Then he looked at me, a little more suspicion in his eyes. Caroline Merritt? Caroline was my given name, but not the name I used. Call me Merritt, please. Detective Jacobs has been in the vice division for fifteen years, my grandfather explained. He's a good man, a trustworthy man, and someone I consider a friend. That was undoubtedly true, given the respectful glances they shared. But Detective Jacobs clearly hadn't made up his mind about me. Of course, I wasn't here to impress anyone. I was only here to tell the truth. So that's what I tried to do. We reviewed what I'd seen at the rave, what I'd learned from Sarah, and what I'd seen tonight. I didn't offer analysis or suspicions, just facts. There was no need, no reason that I could imagine, to insert Selena or GP drama into events that were already dramatic enough. Detective Jacobs asked questions along the way. He rarely made eye contact as we talked, instead keeping his eyes on his paper as he scribbled notes. Much like his suit, his handwriting was neat and tidy. I'm not sure he was any less suspicious by the end of my spiel, but I felt better for having told him. 
He might have been human, but he was also careful, analytical, and focused on details. I didn't get the sense this was a witch hunt, but rather his earnest attempt to solve a problem that just happened to involve vampires. Unfortunately, he didn't have any information about V or where it might be coming from. Like Catcher had said, as the third biggest city in the country, Chicago wasn't exactly immune from drug problems. Detective Jacobs also didn't share any strategies with me, so if he had plans to do his own infiltrating, I wasn't aware of it. But he did give me a card and asked me to call him if I discovered anything else, or if I had anything I thought he could help with. I doubted Ethan would want me involving veteran CPD vice detectives in the investigation of our drug problem. But that's why I'd been named Sentinel, I thought, tucking the card into my pocket. Ethan sat in a plastic chair in the hallway. He was bent over, elbows on his knees, hands clasped together. He tapped his thumbs together, his blonde hair tucked behind his ears. It was the kind of pose you'd have seen on a family member in a hospital waiting room, tired, tense, anticipating the worst. His head lifted at the sound of my boots on the tile floor. He stood up immediately, then moved toward me. You're all right? I nodded. I'm fine. My grandfather thought it would be better to get the story from me. It seemed like the fairest decision, said a voice behind me. I glanced back to see my grandfather moving down the hall toward us. Ethan extended his hand. Mr. Merritt, thank you for your help. My grandfather shook his hand, but he also shook his head. Thank your sentinel. She's a fine representative of your house. Ethan looked at me, pride and love in his eyes. We're in agreement there. I'm tired, I said, and I don't have a car. Could we go back to the house? Absolutely. Ethan's gaze shifted to my grandfather. Did you need anything else from us? No, we're done for now. Enjoy the rest of your night, to the extent possible. Unlikely, I said, patting his arm, but we'll do the best we can. But before we could take a step toward the exit, the doors at the end of the hallway pushed open. Tate walked through, followed by a squadron of suit-clad assistants. They looked drowsy, and I sympathized. It was a crappy job that required hangers-on to wear suits at 5.15 in the morning. Tate strode toward us, both sympathy and irritation in his expression. I figured the irritation was offered up by his strategic half, the political leader anticipating nasty commercials about the vampire problem. The sympathy was probably offered up by his baby-kissing half. He looked at my grandfather first. The situation is contained? It is, Mr. Mayor. Things at the bar are in hand, and Merritt came in and provided us with a very detailed statement so we can get a handle on the issue. Which is? We're still figuring that out, sir. You'll have my report as soon as I can type it. Tate nodded. Appreciate that, Chuck. He glanced at Ethan. Is this related to the problem I asked you to address? It may be, Ethan vaguely said. Merritt is spending most of her free time investigating it including this evening. Tate's expression softened and went all politician. I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. Oh, I could tell, I blandly thought. You probably appreciated it ten to fifteen points in the polls. Tate reached out and shook my hand, and then my grandfather's. Barrett, let's stay in touch. Chuck, I look forward to your report. He reached out to shake Ethan's hand, but instead of a simple shake, he leaned toward Ethan and whispered something in his ear. Ethan's shoulders stiffened, and he stared blankly ahead, barely controlling his anger, when Tate walked away. Ethan's car was parked in a secured lot beside the station. I barely made the short walk. The drama was beginning to take a collective toll. For all my extra vampire strength, I was tired. My brain was fuzzy, my body was exhausted, and my temperature was that strange deep-seated cold that you get before the flu starts up. Ethan opened the door for me and shut it again when I was inside. I checked the clock on the dashboard. It was nearly 5.45, about 20 minutes before dawn. Another late night, and another race against the rising sun. 
Silently, Ethan climbed into the car and started the motor. I made one final play at being the dutiful sentinel. Do you want a debrief now? He must have seen the exhaustion in my eyes, because he shook his head. Luke filled me in on the major points, and the morning news programs are already on the case. Rest for now. I must have taken the direction literally, because I remember nodding in agreement, but not the rest of the ride home. As soon as he pulled out of his parking spot and began spiraling back down through the parking garage, I dropped my head onto the headrest. I woke up again as the car descended into the Catagon parking lot. You are tired, he said. I put a hand over my mouth to hide the burgeoning yawn. It's nearly dawn. So it is. We sat there awkwardly for a moment, like a couple at the end of a first date, neither quite sure what's expected of the other. Ethan made the first move, opening his door and stepping outside. I did the same, wobbling a little as I exited the car, but staying on my feet. I could feel the tug of the sun, my nerves itching with exhaustion, my body screaming that it was time to find a soft, dark place to wait out the day. You going to make it upstairs? he asked. I'll make it. I concentrated on putting one foot in front of the other, blinking to keep my eyes focused. The sun does a number on you, Ethan said as he typed in the code to the basement door, then held it open while I walked through like a near zombie. I was conscious enough to realize that he didn't seem to have the same trouble. You're less affected? I asked as we walked to the stairs. I'm older, he explained. Your body is still adjusting to the genetic change, to the differences between being diurnal and nocturnal. As you get older, you'll find the pull easier to manage. More a gentle suggestion than a grab-and-go. I was capable only of muttering a sound of agreement. By some miracle, I made it to the second-floor landing without falling over. We'll talk tomorrow, Ethan said, and headed for the stairs. But I called his name to stop him. He glanced back. What did Tate whisper in your ear? He said, fix this, goddammit, or else. We'll talk about it tomorrow. He didn't have to tell me twice. Chapter 15 All That Glitters As Ethan had pointed out, one obvious downside of being nocturnal was the fact that the sun exerted more power on me than I cared to admit. On the other hand, I didn't need caffeine to wake up. I might have spent a few minutes being groggy, but the haze blew off quickly enough, leaving a wide awake and usually starving vampire in its wake. I started the evening with a bowl of crunchy cinnamon cereal and as much blood as I could stomach. I'd done a lot of fighting last night, and my stress level had been pretty high. Fighting and stress generally tripped my hunger trigger faster than anything else. Well, maybe other than Ethan. I could confirm the bagged stuff didn't compare in taste to the real thing, but that didn't make it any less satisfying. Nutrition was all well and good, but the emotional comfort also paid off. I showered and dressed in my catagun black. I wasn't sure what the night held in store, but I was confident that after last night's escapades, Darius would be involved at some point. It was probably best to dress a bit nicer than I had been the last time he'd seen me. I brushed my hair until it shone and added my catagun medal and Mary Jane shoes. I'd been so busy with vampire drama that I'd forgotten about Mallory's sorcery drama. So before I went downstairs, I flipped open my phone. I found a message from my father, probably another entreaty to allow him to help Cadogan House. Joshua Merritt was nothing if not persistent. I sent Mallory a message checking in and got back a quick response. Better tonight. Practicum on healing magic. Fun. I wasn't sure if her fun was sarcastic, but healing magic sounded a lot better than dark magic. My phone buzzed again just as I was shutting my door. This time it was a text from Lindsay, and not a promising one. We need to talk, she texted. I hated hearing that. My fingers were fast on the keys. House trauma? Boy trauma, she replied, and my shoulders unknotted a bit trauma of my own making. I wasn't entirely sure how she'd managed to have boy trauma or drama. 
She'd been with me last night, and it wasn't yet an hour after sunset. I couldn't resist asking. How could you have boy drama this early in the evening? Just find me later, she responded. The devil's in the details. Wasn't that always true? A potentially distressing conversation with Lindsay on my agenda for later. I made my way downstairs to Ethan's office. I found him alone, the door open, adjusting the knickknacks he'd salvaged from the battle on his new bookshelves. A little interior decorating to start the night? Trying to make my office feel like my office again. Procrastination can be very satisfying. He laughed ruefully, as you pointed out. It may be a very human emotion, but there's undoubtedly something satisfying about pretending the world is fine and your problems will keep until you're ready to deal with them. It's a lovely coping mechanism, I agreed. I'm glad you've made it to our side. Where's Darius tonight? Scott won the lottery this evening. Darius is at Grey House. He turned and glanced at me. Tell me you learned something last night. Tell me this mess will have some good end. How much should I tell you? I mean, I don't want to put you in an awkward position with Darius. Ethan made a sarcastic sound. You clearly haven't seen last night's local news. I hadn't, and by the tone of his voice, I probably wouldn't want to. That bad? It's so bad. Darius hasn't called me yet. I grimaced. The only thing worse than being yelled at by a boss was having screwed up so royally he'd moved right into silent treatment. I decided not to sugarcoat it. There were details I didn't need to give, information about the vamps who'd actually bought and used the drugs, for one. But I wasn't going to give him a false sense of the problem. It all comes down to V, I began. It's a drug for vampires, not humans. It's somehow making them more aggressive. The house bars, at least for Gray and Cadogan, have been used as distribution points. I'm not sure about Navarre. I gave him a moment to process that information. By the look of him, he needed it. He put an elbow on the shelf, then rubbed his temples with a hand. I have put up with a lot in this house, he said. Unfortunately, vampires aren't any more immune to stupidity than humans. He dropped his hand and looked away. The corners of his eyes wrinkled with disappointment. I would have hoped that they respected the house and me more than this. I'm sorry, Ethan. He shook his head and shook it off. Tell me about the bar. Colin hadn't seen anything out of the ordinary. I asked Jeff to pull the security footage so we can figure out how it's getting in. It's definitely getting in, although I had everyone hand over their stash so they couldn't bring it back into the house. And so it wouldn't be found on them if the cops patted them down. Exactly, I agreed. But my grandfather had already found it in the bar, so he'd already put two and two together. I gave him the rest of the drugs, and that's when they brought in Detective Jacobs. Your theory? Still working it out. In terms of the overall picture, we've now had two instances of extra-violent vamps and drugs in the same place at the same time. As for the why of it, I shrugged. Who's pushing the drugs? Someone who wants us in trouble? Someone who wants vamps bringing down the houses on their own? Someone who wants to take us down one pill at a time? That doesn't sound like Selena, he pointed out. Not unless she's decided all vamps have to suffer for her crimes, I agreed. Morgan didn't think that was likely, but I wouldn't put it past her. Until you have more evidence, I'm not conceding that point. What about McKetrick? He's focused on forcing us out of Chicago. Perhaps he's pushing V to rile up the vampires and pressure Tate into deporting us. McKetrick was outside the bar last night, I said. I saw him, then pointed him out to catch her. He was going to tail McKetrick and get what info he could. I made a mental note to follow up with him later. That said, McKetrick may hate us, but making vamps extra aggressive risks a lot of collateral damage. I don't see it being part of his master plan. Whoever is behind it. We need to find them and stop the distribution before things get any worse. Coincidence. Those are the first two things on my to-do list. I have item three for you. 
Dinner at Gray House this evening with Darius and the Masters. Darius also invited Gabriel and Tanya. One o'clock. We leave from here. And it's formal, of course. Since Darius seemed like a rule stickler, the formal bit didn't surprise me. But I was curious about his invitation to Gabriel and Tanya, Gabriel's wife. Vampires and shifters had a historically nasty relationship. A lot of distrust and angst by vampires. A lot of eye-rolling and denial by shifters. Why invite Gabriel and Tanya? I asked. If I was being generous, I'd say Darius was interested in improving intersup relations. But he's more likely attempting to micromanage our relationship with the Pax. It would be bad for the Chicago houses to completely alienate the Pax. But in Darius's mind, it would be altogether worse to become too cozy with them. There have never been official allegiances with a Pax before. If we pulled it off, it would indicate a definite shift in power in our direction. At his mention of the potential pack allegiance, I looked away. Ethan's fear that our relationship, or our future breakup, would endanger our burgeoning friendship with the North American Central was the reason he'd given for the breakup he now regretted. Come on, Ethan suddenly said, walking toward the door. I glanced up again, moved from my reverie. Where are we going? Ops room. I was supposed to have you downstairs fifteen minutes ago. I followed him obediently to the basement stairs and toward the ops room. The door was open. Luke, Juliet, Kelly, Malik, and Lindsay were already assembled around the conference table. Luke, in a faded denim shirt and jeans, was an interesting contrast to the rest of the guards, who were all dressed in black. Ethan closed the door. I took an empty seat at the table, and he took the chair beside me. I glanced between Luke and Lindsay, who sat on opposite ends of the table, trying to read the tea leaves regarding her message earlier. But she wore her usual expression of mildly amused boredom. Luke was scanning the paper on the ops room table, a steaming mug in his hand. If they were at odds, I couldn't tell, and there wasn't any obvious negative magic in the air. Finally, they join us, Luke said, sipping his drink. Normally that kind of comment would have been a tease coming from him. This time it sounded like a rebuke, and Luke didn't normally err toward grouchiness. Maybe he and Lindsay had gotten into something. We were on our best behavior, Ethan advised him. Merritt was filling me in on last night's investigation. Do tell, Luke said. Long story short, it's the V that's been causing the violence. Luke frowned, sat up, and put his mug on the tabletop, hands wrapped around it like it was providing necessary warmth. I'd been cold as a newbie vampire, and it had taken some time to ward off that chill, but it was August and probably ninety degrees outside. I didn't understand people who drank coffee in the heat of summer. Why would some lowlife sell drugs to vamps and get them together for parties? What's he trying to accomplish? Merritt thinks McKetrick might be involved, Ethan said, that maybe it's a ploy to get vamps out of the city. I put up a hand. That was actually Ethan's idea, I said, giving credit where credit was due. Or distributing the blame accordingly. Luke tilted his head back and forth while he considered it. Whoever came up with it, it's not a bad idea. Although manufacturing the drug, distributing it, organizing the parties, and everything else in the chain means a lot of work just to get rid of a population, there are easier ways. Agreed, Malik said. And at the risk of jumping on one of our favorite bandwagons, the first witness saw a woman named Marie. Any votes for Selena? But we haven't heard anything about her since then, I pointed out. So if she's involved, she's staying under the radar. I'm having Jeff Christopher check the bar's security tapes, so if there's any sign of her, or any more details about the cellar, we'll find them. Luke nodded, and picked up a remote that sat beside his mug. In that case, a little more good news to brighten up your evening. He held up the remote and mashed buttons until the clip on the screen began to play. It was a recorded news program. We caught the end of a story about international warfare before the headline switched to read, Vamp Violence in Wrigleyville. The female anchor, 
polished in her jewel-toned suit, her stiff hair a helmet above her head, offered up the rest. In this morning's top local news, she said, an uptick in violence in the city is deemed the result of a drug called V that's circulating among the city's vampire community. They cut to an image of a white V tablet in someone's hand and then to a shot of Temple Bar. One such event was last night's disturbance at a Wrigleyville bar with ties to Cadogan House. We were live on the scene last night, and here's what one local resident had to say. They cut to a video of the two frat boys from Temple Bar. Oh, those traitorous little shits, Lindsay muttered. Those are the humans Christine talked to. It was awful in there, said the taller of the two boys. All those vamps just wailing on each other. It was like they just went crazy. Did you fear for your life? asked an off-screen reporter. Oh, absolutely, he said. How could you not? I mean, they're vampires. We're just humans. The atom bomb was invented by just humans, Malik muttered. World War II and the Spanish Inquisition were perpetrated by just humans. We were clearly not a receptive crowd for muck-raking journalism. Alderman Pat Jones and Clarence Walker issued statements this morning calling for an investigation of Chicago's vampire houses and their role in this new drug. Mayor Tate responded to events this morning after meeting with his economic counsel. The newscast cut to a shot of Tate shaking hands with a woman in an unflattering suit. Beside a plain-looking bureaucrat, he looked that much more like a romance novel hero. Seductive eyes, dark hair, wicked smile. You had to wonder how many votes he'd gotten because voters just wanted to be near him. When reporters began peppering him with questions about the bar fight, he held up both hands and smiled affectionately. That smile, I thought, walked a thin line between empathy and condescension. I have made Chicago's houses well aware of their responsibilities, and I'm sure they'll take whatever precautions are necessary to put an immediate stop to the spread of V and the violence. If they don't, of course, steps will have to be taken. My administration is not afraid to take those steps. We've done a lot of work to remake this city into one that Illinois can be proud of, and we will continue to ensure that Chicago remains a place of peace and prosperity. The anchor popped on screen again. Mayor Tate's approval rating remains consistently high, even in light of the recent violence. With that, Luke reached up with the remote and stopped the video again. The room went silent and heavy with concern. I guessed I now knew why my father had called. He was probably dying to berate me for being a vampire and sullying the family name, despite the fact that I'd had no say in becoming fanged, and I was trying my best to keep the peace in Chicago. Unless his tone had changed about that as well. Well, Ethan finally said. It does comfort me so to know that Mayor Tate's approval ratings remain strong. Tate must be feeding the anchors with information, I offered. We only barely know about the uptick in violence, and my grandfather promised to keep V out of the press. So Tate's using vamps to make political hay, Luke offered. I guess it's not the first time a politician's taken advantage of chaos, but it sure would be nice if it wasn't at our expense. And if he didn't have an arrest warrant ready, I agreed. Way to put the city first, Lindsay said. Luke glanced over at Ethan, concern in his expression. Anything from Darius? He's still on radio silence. It's not going to go over well. Drugs and violence in my bar. Drugs and violence covered by local paparazzi that will probably spread to national coverage, if it hasn't already. No, I don't imagine he will be pleased, and there's a good chance the house will suffer for it. Tell him the other part, Kelly said. The other part, Ethan asked, his gaze shifting from Kelly to Luke. The other part, Luke confirmed, picking up the tablet and tapping its screen. The image on the projector shifted from the newscast to a black-and-white live feed of a dark neighborhood street. During my stint as an on-duty house guard, I'd seen that feed enough times to be familiar with it. That's outside Cadogan House. Good eye, Sentinel, Luke complimented. Indeed it is. He tapped the tablet again and zoomed into the feed, fixing on a boxy sedan that held two passengers, 
Both wore suits. Kelly went for a run. She noticed the sedan when she left, and she noticed the sedan when she came back. Twenty-six miles, Kelly put in. It took me an hour and twenty-four minutes. Not bad for a marathon-length run. Chalk one up for vampire speed. That's a long time for two guys in suits to be sitting in a car outside the house, Ethan said, then looked back at Luke. It's an unmarked CPD car. That's our thought. Neither the car nor the suit seem like McKetrick's crew, so we figured detectives. We called the Umbud's office to confirm, but they had no idea about the car. I muttered a curse. They had no idea about Mr. Jackson's rave, either. Tate isn't being entirely candid with the office right now. A lack of trust, Ethan wondered. Or perhaps a fear that the Umbud's office is tied too closely to Cadogan House, I suggested. Tate's office doesn't give the Umbud's office all the information, which acts like a check and balance on my grandfather. Lindsay grimaced. That's a slap in the face. Yes, it is, I agreed. I guess the cop car signals Tate's lack of trust in us, too. Ethan shuffled in his chair. Given the fact that he's got a warrant for my arrest ready to go, I'd say so. My cell phone buzzed. I pulled it out and checked the caller ID. Speak of the devil, it's Jeff. I flipped it open. Hey, Jeff, got anything for me? Jeff chuckled. Of course I do, but I'm strictly off limits now. You know, because of the little lady. No disrespect meant to you or yours. Hey, I'm in the ops room with Ethan and everyone. Can I put you on speaker? Knock yourself out. Probably helpful for all to hear. I put the phone down in the middle of the table, then pressed the speaker button. Okay, you're live. What do you have? Ah, if I'd only prepared a monologue. We heard Catcher's voice in the background. Focus, kid. Well, Jeff said, and I heard the clacking of keys. It turns out the security cameras are live, and Colin and Sean do record the video. It's stored in the bar on a dedicated server. And there are also external backups, just in case some bad stuff goes down. I was actually pretty impressed. You don't expect bars to have that kind of security protocol. From the looks of the crusty back room, Temple Bar definitely didn't seem like the kind of establishment with a dedicated server. Not that I could differentiate a dedicated server from an undedicated server. So anyway, I grabbed the video and uploaded it. I leaned forward, linking my hands together on the table. Tell me you found something, Jeff. It took some spooling, he said. Trucks use the alley quite a bit to make deliveries. There's also the occasional catering truck pickup. Garbage trucks, taxis, bar drop-offs, etc., etc., but beginning two months ago, every couple of days, usually in the wee hours, a vintage Shelby Mustang, wicked car, pulls into the alley. Sometimes the car sits there for a few minutes. Nothing happens. The car drives away. Sometimes a driver gets out. My heart began to beat in anticipation. We were getting closer. I knew it. What did the driver look like? Well, although the backups are impressive, the video is for shit. Very grainy. But I did manage to pull a still for you. I'm going to send you a pic. Use this email, Luke said, reading off an address to Jeff and picking up one of the tablets from the desktop. That way we can project the image. Done and done. Jeff had barely gotten out the words before Luke's tablet dinged, signaling a new message. His fingers danced across the tablet, and an image popped onto the screen. The guy was short, maybe five feet in shoes. Older, with slick, dark hair and bulbous features. There was nothing especially remarkable about his face, but I would have sworn I'd seen him before. Does he look familiar to anyone? I asked, but got muttered nose around the room. The others might not have recognized him, but I had a sense Sarah would have. He matches the description of the guy Sarah, the human at the Streeterville party, met, I said. Make my night and tell me you got a license plate on the car, Jeff. Because I am, in fact, awesome, I was able to zero into the video. I got the license of the car, then ran it through the DMV system. The car is registered to one Polly Surmock. Jeff read out an address. 
The interwebs say his address is near the Garfield Park Conservatory. I made plans to pay Mr. Surmock a visit. I also opened my eyes again and smiled at the phone. Jeff, you are a paragon of man. The funny thing is, Jeff continued, the car's title shows a recent sale, only a few months ago, to our Mr. Surmock. But there's no information about the prior owner or who he purchased the car from. I frowned at the phone. Well, that seems weird. Definitely weird, Jeff agreed. When we're looking at records, too much data usually signals a plant. Not enough data signals a scrub. Vehicle sales are almost always in the system. There's no reason for them not to be. This file had scrub all over it. Oh, and that's not all. We're listening. Because I am, in fact, not just supremely awesome, but also all that and a bag of chips, preferably kettle-cooked jalapeno of some kind, I checked Mr. Surmock's criminal record in the Cook County DB. I mean, probably not supposed to go into their system without permission, but what else is a boy to do when his favorite vamp makes a call? Indeed. What did you learn? Factually, not much. There's one sealed criminal record in the file, and that's it. Do you think that file was scrubbed too? Eh, not necessarily. You can seal criminal files for all sorts of legitimate reasons. To protect the victim, because the perp's underage, because the perp's a brain-eating, mind-dead zombie with no mens rea whatsoever. Sealed record, Ethan prompted. Yeah, so the file is sealed, and I can't access any data. They're actually rocking some pretty good encryption on the sealed records. I'd need the access key or password, or you'd have to get a court order to pull the file. So a dead end there. Ha, <laughs> you made a joke. But yes, very dead. Dead as a doornail. Dead as a doorknob, even. Although, I'm not sure I know what the difference is between those two things. We got it. Oh, one final thing. I heard more key tapping, the sound overlaid by Jeff's humming. It sounded like white Christmas. A little early for Christmas carols, isn't it, Jeff? Never hurts to get into the holiday spirit, Merritt. Okay, so the video isn't great and the alley by the bar door isn't very well lit. But occasionally, on a full moon, the light shines just right. As he trailed off, I heard more tapping. Okay, he said again. I'm going to send you another image. This one was a fuzzy black and white shot of a car in the alley. Jeff was right. The image was grainy. But the vehicle it showed was undeniably a classic Mustang, complete with racing stripes and side vents. And that wasn't all. I squinted at the picture, trying in vain to bring it into focus. Is that a woman in the passenger seat? It appears to be so, Jeff said. It's more of a shadow, but it does appear to be a woman. Curves, you know. We know, Ethan said dryly. Anyway, I was checking out the shadow of the lady in the video, right? I'm running the film like half speed, and I find something else. I've got a close-up, and I'm going to send it to you. Again, the tablet beeped, and a new black-and-white image replaced the previous one on our screen. I squinted at it, but predatory eyesight or not, I still couldn't get a good read on the woman in the car. In fact, I couldn't get a good read on anything other than pixels. What are we supposed to be looking at? I wondered aloud. Check the middle of the image, Jeff said approximately where her collar would be. I just opened my mouth to protest that I couldn't see anything, and that was when I saw it, around her neck, an undeniable glint of light. Jeff, that looks like a house medal, not unlike the one I'd seen Selena wearing the night she returned to Catagon House. That's what I thought, too. Can you zoom in any closer? Ethan asked. Unfortunately, I can't give you any more details. The camera sensor just didn't record any more data. But that's something, isn't it? It kind of suggests you got a house vamp involved in this drug business. Malik and Ethan exchanged a heavy glance. It does suggest that, Ethan agreed. But for now, let's keep this between us, shall we? You're the boss, Jeff pleasantly said. Thanks, Jeff. We appreciate it. Unfortunately, I've got bad news to go along with the good news. What's that? I asked. Polly Surmock's the only suspect we've got for distributing V. 
I narrowed down the video late last night and had to turn it over to the CPD this morning. Of course, I said, Detective Jacobs would have been interested in the video. Is and was. They sent detectives to Sir Mock's house this morning. Ethan frowned at the phone. Did they find anything? Not a thing. The house was clean. The car was clean. They're still processing some of the stuff they lifted for trace evidence, but there's nothing that ties him to the drugs or the raves. As far as we know, he's just a guy in a public alley. He had every right to be there. Be that as it may, my gut said Polly Surmock was more than a passerby, and I'd bet that if we called up every Katagun vampire who'd been in Temple Bar in the last month, they could pin him as the guy who'd been loitering outside and pushing V. Of course, that would require calling out each Katagun vamp. I wasn't willing, at least at this point, to drag the individual vampires into it. Thanks, Jeff. Any objections if I pay Mr. Sir Mock a visit on my own? At my suggestion, Ethan's head shot up, but he didn't voice an objection. Not from us, and CPD doesn't have to know. Hey, Chuck's paging me, so I've got to go. We've got a couple of fairies who want him to mediate a property dispute, and I need to upload some docs. We'll be in touch. Thanks, Jeff, I said, then tapped off the phone. The ops room was quiet for a moment. I looked up and around at the vamps in the room. Any thoughts before I visit our apparent drug pusher? How opposed are you to capital punishment? Luke growled out. I'd prefer not to play judge, jury, and executioner, I said. But if you have any strategic or diplomatic suggestions, I'm all for them. Ethan patted my back good-naturedly. Good, Sentinel. Chapter 16 The Perp Lindsay escorted me to my room so I could change back into boots and grab my sword. I usually skipped bringing it along on public outings, but Polly Sermock was quite possibly a drug kingpin, and I was heading to his home turf. No way was I going on that field trip without steel. It wasn't until we were inside with the door shut, Lindsay on my bed while I sat on the floor, sword unsheathed before me to ensure it was in fighting shape that she made the confession she'd apparently been holding in. We made out, she said. I wiped the blade down with a sheet of rice paper. I don't recall making out with you. I made out with Connor. I looked up at her and couldn't help the disappointment that crossed my face. Connor was a vamp from my initiate class, a sweet kid with whom Lindsay had been flirting since our commendation into the house. He was cute and charming in his way, but he was no Luke. When did that happen? I got back from Temple Bar, and a bunch of us were talking in the downstairs parlor, and then everyone got tired and left. Everyone but him, I mean. And then one thing led to another. The blade clean, I resheathed the sword again. One thing led you to making out with a newbie vampire. That would appear to be the case. What was new, I thought, was the fact that she was chagrined about it. Lindsay wasn't much of a worrywart, and it wasn't her style to Monday morning quarterback her own decisions. Maybe Luke was making progress. I tilted my head at her. So why do you seem weird about it? Hands in her lap, shoulders slumped forward guiltily, Lindsay looked away. I thought of the edge I'd heard in Luke's voice earlier, and figured out the reason for it. Luke found out? She nodded. Crap, Linz. Yeah, crap. When she looked back at me, a tear slid down her cheek. She wiped it away nonchalantly, but there was no mistaking the guilt in her eyes. This thing with Connor, was it a fling? Just because you'd had a really long night? I don't know what it is. That's kind of my problem. I just, I don't know. I'm not ready to be in some big... She swirled her hands in the air committed relationship thing. Not ready. You're over a century old. That is so not the point. Look, Luke and I met a long, long time ago. He had a girlfriend. I had a beau. He's hot, sure. Obviously he's hot. But we started off friends. And I'd just rather we stay friends than become some kind of mortal enemies. I gave her a dubious look. How could you and Luke become mortal enemies? I'm not even sure he has mortal enemies. Well, other than Selena. 
And Peter. Definitely Peter, she agreed, then shrugged. I don't know. It's just, immortality is a long time. I could be alive a long time, and I'm having a hard time imagining only one guy being a part of that. My sword in hand, I stood up, moved to the bed, and sat down beside her. So, bottom line is, no big commitment thing right now? Yeah, she said sadly. I hated that for both of them, her for the guilt, him for the heartache. So what are you going to do? What can I do? Break his heart? Tell him I'm not interested in settling down? She flopped back on the bed. This is why I avoided it for so long. Because he's my boss, and if we tried it and it didn't work, it was that much more awkward for everyone. Precisely. We sat there quietly for a moment. So, how about them cubbies? She finally asked, fake cheer in her voice. Name one current Cubs player. Um, that hot one with the broad shoulders and the soul patch? And that's what I get for being friends with a damn Yankees fan. I am useless, she muttered, then pulled a pillow over her face. A muffled, frustrated scream escaped it. You're not useless. Hey, if nothing else, you're one of the top ten hotties in Catagon House, right? I'd put you at least in the top three. She lifted a corner of the pillow and blew hair from her face. Really? Really. She smiled a little. You're the best sentinel ever. Yeah, sometimes I wondered. Luke and Ethan met me on the first floor again. You've got your phone in case you need us. I do, I assured him, patting my jacket pocket. If the cops didn't find anything at his house, he probably won't be territorial enough to start anything but I will definitely call you if the need arises. Don't worry. She rather likes being alive, Ethan finished for me. I do, I said with a smile. Keep an eye out for accomplices, Luke offered. If he's truly clean, someone must be doing the dirty work for him. They could be on alert after the CPD sweep. It's also possible he changed protocols afterwards, Ethan said. I'll get a good look before I go in. He knows he's on the watch list, so he probably won't be that surprised to see me. The bigger question is, if I find him, what do I do with him? Ethan arched a suspicious eyebrow. I'm not suggesting homicide, I explained. But if the CPD couldn't find anything, it's not like I could bring him in. Just get the information you can, Ethan said, and stay safe. Don't worry about engaging him. We know where he is and how to find him. At least until he bolts, Luke said. And do be back in time for dinner, Ethan reminded me. I remember. I'll even be back in time to clean up and dress respectably. I had to. I was heading to a meeting with three housemasters and the head of the GP. There's no way I was going in there without being dolled up. Ethan smiled back. That would be much appreciated. At the sound of footsteps on the hardwood floors, we all turned around. Malik stood at the edge of the hallway, his expression wan. Darius is on the phone, he announced. He'd like to speak to us. Luke and Ethan exchanged a glance that made me nervous, even though it was one of those looks that commanding officers share so they don't have to speak the words aloud and freak out the soldiers. My office, Ethan said, then glanced at me. Work your magic, Sentinel and close this thing down. He followed Malik back down the hallway, and then they both disappeared into Ethan's office. I glanced at Luke. You want to walk me to my car? Happy to. I led the way down the sidewalk to the Catagon gate. As per usual, two fairies stood at attention as we passed, but this time one of them was a girl. She had the same straight dark hair as the male mercenaries and her face was sculpted and gaunt in a European supermodel kind of way. She also wore the same black ensemble as her counterpart and gave me the same look of disinterest as I passed. Have the mercenary fairies gone egalitarian? I asked Luke as we headed down the street, ignoring the screams of the protesters. There were more camped out this evening, probably because of the morning's news report, and they led with the new classic, No More Vampires, no more vampires. Apparently we'd previously had male fairies because no women applied for the job. She did. 
What's her name? Not a clue, Luke said. I don't even know the names of the guys who stand there, and we've had the mercs on contract for years. They prefer to stay professional. We walked past a boxy sedan parked across the street from the house. Both guys in the front seat munched on sandwiches. Binoculars and paper coffee cups were stashed on the dashboard. I assumed those were our cops. Not exactly subtle, are they? I murmured to Luke. About as subtle as vampires on V. Ouch. Too soon? Let's wait until we aren't under threat of indictment. And speaking of uncomfortable topics, about Lindsay. She's killing me, Sentinel. I know. I'm sorry. I saw her kiss him. Honestly, I don't think she has feelings for Connor. I just don't think she's ready to settle down. He stopped on the sidewalk and looked at me. Do you think she'll come around? I certainly hope so, but you know how stubborn she is. Luke laughed mirthlessly. We reached my orange car, and he popped a fist gently on the trunk. I definitely know that, Sentinel. I suppose I decide to wait her out, or I don't. Not a whole lot else I can do. I gave him a sympathetic smile. I guess so. By the way, do you have any plans to tell me which vamps were using V? They need to be interviewed. I shook my head. No dice. I turned my back when they handed over the drugs. And I promised not to offer up their identities if they did. I made a promise, and I won't break it. I won't reveal my source. I'd expected irritation or a lecture about duty to the house and its vampires, but I didn't get one. He almost looked proud. Well played, Sentinel. I nodded at him, then adjusted my sword and stepped into the car. While I'm gone, make sure Ethan doesn't murder Darius. I'll do my best. Good luck, Luke said, closing the door. I hoped I wouldn't need it. I wasn't fancy enough to have a GPS unit, which would have seemed odd in the Volvo anyway. So I found Polly Surmock's house the old-fashioned way, with a street address and directions printed from the Internet, offered up by Kelly before I left the house. Jeff had been right. Surmock's place wasn't far from the Garfield Park Conservatory. The conservatory was an amazing place, but this area had definitely seen better days. Some chunks of the block were empty of houses, the little remaining grass strewn with trash. Many of the buildings, grand stone apartment houses and World War II-era homes, had seen better days. Surmock's house was nondescript, a narrow two-story building with gray shingles and a highly pitched roof. The yard was neat, the grass clipped, but with no real landscaping to speak of. The remains of a paper fast food bag were sprinkled across the lawn probably caught in a mower blade, and no one had cared enough to clean up. He was lucky in one respect. Unlike the rest of the houses on this side of the block, Sir Mox had a side garage. It wasn't attached, but it was a garage nonetheless, and it gave him a way to avoid what thousands of other Chicagoans had to face every day, residential on-street parking. I parked my car a few houses down the block, then grabbed my sword and a small black flashlight from the glove box. Once outside, I belted on my sword and pushed the flashlight into my pocket. I locked up the car, took a good look around for any errant McKetricks or unmarked police cars, and started walking. I'd been standing sentinel for a few months now. While I wasn't thrilled about the battles, I was getting used to them. But the part of the work that still made me nervous was the walk-up. I'd been nervous walking down Michigan with Jonah, but at least I'd had someone to keep me company and keep my mind off the task ahead. Now I was alone in a dark, quiet neighborhood with nothing but my thoughts. I hated the anticipation of violence. I stopped beside the house's black plastic mailbox. The red flag was raised, but I resisted the urge to open the box and see what he was mailing out. I had enough problems without adding mail tampering to the list. Sir Mock's garage was dark, as was the top floor of the house. The first floor glowed with light. The security door was open. The screen door was closed. Start with the garage, I murmured, tiptoeing through the grass on the far side of the lot. The driveway, such as it was, consisted of two thin lines of concrete, just enough to give a car tire a bit of protection from the mud. 
I stuck to the grass to muffle the sound of my boots. While I planned to knock on the front door at some point, I wanted to check out the lay of the land first, and that required sneakiness. The garage was narrow, an old style with a pull-up door and a row of windows across the top. I pulled out my flashlight, twisted it on, and peeked inside. A thrill shot through me. A gleaming Mustang was parked inside, the same car we'd seen on the security feed, a coupe with white racing stripes and the telltale Mustang side scoops. The car was gorgeous. Whatever Sir Mock's problems, I couldn't fault his taste in vehicles. I snapped an image with my camera phone and considered the confirm vehicle box checked. Next stop, the house. I crossed the lawn and headed for the small concrete porch. A television show from the 80s, complete with laugh track, blared through the screen door. When I reached the porch, I wrapped my left hand around my sword handle, squeezing it for comfort. I could see through the house to the kitchen and the avocado green stove and refrigerator. The house inside was simply decorated with motel-style furniture. Plain and thrifty, but serviceable. Can I help you? I blinked when a man stepped up to the door, the man from the Temple Bar video. He wore a Yankee sweatshirt that had seen better days and a pair of well-worn jeans. He smiled, revealing a mouthful of straight, white teeth. And he might have lived in Chicago, but the accent was all New York. I decided to get to the point. Holly Sirmock? You got him, he said, head tilted to the side as he took in my features, and then my sword. Your merit. He must have seen the surprise in my eyes as he chuckled. I know who you are, kid. I watch television, and I expect I know why you're here. He flipped the lock on the screen door and pulled it open a little. You want to come in? I'm good where I am. I might have been curious, but I wasn't stupid. I'd rather stay out here with the city at my back than willingly go into the home of a suspect. He let the door shut again and crossed his arms on the other side of it. In that case, why don't we get to it? You were looking for me. Now you found me. What do you want with me? You spent some time at Temple Bar lately? Is that a question or a statement? Since we both know you parked your car outside the bar, let's say it's a statement. He shrugged negligently. I'm a small businessman, just trying to make my way in the world. What's your business, Mr. Sermock? He smiled grandly. Community relations. Is Wrigleyville the relevant community? Hawley rolled his eyes. Kid, I got interests all over the city. All these questions, and I was beginning to feel like a cross between a cop and an investigative reporter, with none of the credentials or authority. Is it any coincidence that you start popping up outside Temple Bar and a new drug hits the streets? In case you ain't already aware, the men and women in blue have been through my house from top to bottom. You imply that I've been distributing drugs, but don't you think they would have found something if I had been? I sized him up for a moment. Mr. Sermock, would you like to know what I think? He smiled slowly, like an eager hyena. As it turns out, yeah, I would like to hear what you think. You had the forethought to keep any trace of V out of your house. I think that makes you an incredibly smart and resourceful man. The question, then, is where you're keeping the drugs and who you're getting them from. How would you like to fill me in on that? Holly Sermock stared at me, wide-eyed, for a moment before erupting with laughter, the belly-aching kind that soon had him coughing uncontrollably. When he finally stopped guffawing, he wiped tears from the corners of his eyes with fingers that were longer and more delicate than I thought they'd be, like the fingers of a pianist but attached to a shortish, barrel-chested drug pusher. Oh, Jesus, he said. You're gonna give me an embolism, kid. But you're a kick, you know that? And you aren't exactly shy, are you? Is that a no? The business world is a very delicate place. You've got higher-ups, middlemen, and everyday run-of-the-mill vendors, such as yourself, as you say. Now, if I draw too much attention to those other levels, the entire balance gets thrown off, and that makes management unhappy. Is McKetrick your management? 
He went quiet for a moment. Who's McKetrick? I couldn't be certain, but I had a sense his confusion was legitimate. That Sir Mock really didn't know who McKetrick was. Besides, he'd all but admitted he was selling drugs. Why start lying now? A thought occurred to me, and not the kind of thought that was going to help me sleep better at night. I was the granddaughter of a cop, and a vampire with connections to Cadogan House. Why wouldn't he lie to me, unless he thought vampires couldn't touch him, or whomever he worked for? And who was the only woman the GP wouldn't let us touch? I had to inquire, but I didn't want to make him or Selena skittish. Do you work alone? I asked him. Most of the time, he carefully said, as if not sure where the question was headed. With vampires? Honey, I've got a carotid. Given the nature of the merch, I prefer to get in and get out with as few fangs as possible. You were spotted with a vamp named Marie. Polly stared back at me, refusing to respond. Maybe he hadn't noticed the security camera. Brave as he might have been about the V, Sir Mock apparently wasn't willing to admit Selena's involvement. I wasn't sure what that signaled, if anything, and I was running out of ideas. I know what you think it stands for, Polly said. What? V, he said. The name of the drug. You think it means vampire, right? I paused for a moment, surprised he was willing to be that overt about it. It had occurred to me. I finally got out. He pointed a finger at me. Then you'd be wrong. Stands for veritas. as a Latin word meaning truth. Idea is, it's supposed to remind vamps what being a real vampire feels like. The old school flying bats, Transylvania horror film bloodlust. The good kind of bloodlust. And battling. No wussy pansy human bullshit. Getting out there and mixing it up. Is a gift, V, to the vampires. Veritas. Truth, he repeated. Personally, I appreciate that. That was an awfully philosophical explanation. And what makes you so generous toward vamps? I'm not generous, kid. I'm not saying I've seen V, but if I had, it ain't the kind of thing I'd get involved in out of the goodness of my heart. It's more the kind of thing I'd consider making a living from. Who would? Polly snorted. Who do you think would have the motivation to do something like that? To make vamps crazy for blood? To make them want to act like real vampires? He shrugged. All I can say is, you gotta go higher up in the chain than me, doll. Another hint about Selena? Or maybe another higher up in Chicago's houses? I needed more info. You want to point me in the right direction? I take the chance of reducing my income? No thanks, kid. An old-school telephone rang from somewhere in the house. Polly glanced back at it, then at me. You need anything else? Not at the moment. In that case, you know where to find me. He stepped back and closed the door, and the house shook a bit on its foundations as he walked back to the phone and silenced its ringing. I closed my eyes and closed out some of the extraneous neighborhood noise focusing in on the telephone call. Wrong number, I heard him say, the telephone's bell ringing as he put it back on its cradle again. I walked back down the stairs and across the yard to the driveway, then turned back to face the house. I gnawed my lip for a moment, trying to figure out my next move. Even in the dark, it was obvious the paint was peeling in sizable chunks away from the shingles, the roof looked awful, and the screen in the door was ripped across the bottom. I glanced back at the garage. Polly's house was in pretty miserable shape, but he had a perfect vintage Mustang. If he couldn't even afford to fix up the house, how could he afford to pay for the Mustang? I didn't know the answer, but I thought it was worth exploring. I pulled out my phone and sent a message to Jeff. No dice at the Surmock house. Keep looking at the car. I'd just gotten back into the car when Jeff called back. That was fast. I said. We were on the same wavelength. I've been pouring through databases since we talked earlier, and I've got nothing about the sale of the car. If this thing was actually sold, I mean, if money exchanged hands, it was an off-the-grid sale. The only way we're going to be able to trace it now is if Sir Mock happened to tell you who sold it to him. Negatory on that one, 
I guess that makes the car a dead end. Unless you randomly bump into the guy who sold it to Sir Mock. In a city of nearly three million? Unlikely. But he did give me an idea. While I couldn't exactly cuddle up to Selena and ask her if she knew Polly Surmock, I knew someone else who might. I checked my watch. It was only eleven o'clock. I had time for a little trip east and some zen deep breathing exercises before I got there, because I was going to need all the patience I could muster. Do me a favor, would you, Jeff? Email me the picture of Surmock from the video footage. You got it. Once I'd received his email, I put away the phone. I considered calling Ethan to give him an update, but the idea made my stomach roil. He'd just been on the phone with Darius, and I really didn't want to know how that conversation had played out. Ethan probably also wouldn't have approved of my next trip. No, a visit to Navarre House seemed like one of those things for which it would be easier to apologize later than get permission in the first place especially with a grouchy GP leader in the city. Decision made, I pulled away from the curb. It was time to visit the Gold Coast. Chapter 17 Two Masters and One Bad Attitude I was halfway to Navarre House when the phone rang again. It was Jonah, so I flipped it open and nestled the phone between my ear and shoulder. Hi, Jonah. What's up? Just checking in. How's the investigation progressing? Well, we were able to ID the short man Sarah saw outside the bar, found video with his car on it, guy named Polly Surmock. I just paid him a visit. Get anything interesting? Not really. He's got a crappy house and a fabulous vintage Mustang. He's not exactly shy about his work, but his story is that he's a bit player, who says he's got management running the show. The police didn't find anything to pin on him so I don't think we'll have much luck either. Any chance McKettrick's in charge? He seems to have no idea who McKettrick is. He also says V stands for Veritas. Truth? The very same. That's awfully deep for a pill pusher. That's exactly what I thought. Great minds and all, he said, with an amusing tone in his voice. You coming to the shindig tonight? I am. You? With bells on and a fine Italian suit I have no choice but to wear. Just be glad you only have to pull it out on special occasions, I told him. You guys get jerseys. We get fine Italian suits every night. He chuckled. Very true. Hey, speaking of Ethan, a heads up. My story is that we met for the first time outside Temple Bar after the incident. Fine by me. Have you talked to Darius this trip? Not yet. I've been with the guards today. We were training. Why? Just a heads up. He's kind of an ass. I regretted the words the instant they were out of my mouth. Sure, Jonah had done me a solid. But did I really know anything about him, other than his pretty boy looks and ridiculous overabundance of graduate degrees? Well aware, Jonah said. He and Scott went around about the jerseys, actually. Darius found them unbecoming of housed vampires. I couldn't help but chuckle. That does sound like something he would say. I guess Scott won the battle eventually. I wouldn't say he won it, per se. More like he wouldn't give in, and Darius eventually lost interest in the argument. That's a risky strategy with an immortal, I said. They've got all the time in the world to argue. Speaking on your own behalf? Me? Of course not. I'm not at all stubborn and completely flexible. Liar, he slyly said. Well, I'll stop harassing you and let you get back to it. Call me if you need me. Will do. Thanks. I tucked the phone away again, a little weirded out by the phone call. It was nice of Jonah to check in, to work from the assumption V was a problem vamps needed to face together. All hands on deck, as it were, instead of the sentinel going it solo. On the other hand, the conversation had sounded a little... Dady. He was checking in, asking what I was doing later. Maybe he hadn't meant anything by it. Maybe he was really warming up to me and my various charms. But there was a flirty, friendly edge to his voice that I hadn't heard before. And I wasn't entirely thrilled to hear it now. Flattered? Yes. But I didn't need the complication. 
I also wasn't thrilled that I'd just given Jonah an update I hadn't yet provided to Ethan. I didn't like deception, especially not when it came to deceiving someone who'd saved my life once upon a time. I knew why I was withholding information from him, but that didn't make it any more comfortable. The irony? I'd railed against Ethan for withholding information from me. Not that it had stopped him, but it still drove me crazy. And here I was, doing the same thing. Were my reasons any better? Had his been any worse? And although we weren't a couple, the dishonesty felt wrong, like a breach of the trust we'd earned, a kind of trust that went beyond Sentinel and Master. I was also missing out on using Ethan as a sounding board about Jonah and the RG. If there was any possibility he could be neutral, a second opinion would have been helpful. But as a master, he couldn't be neutral. So as much as I didn't like it, there was no clear path to the truth right now. I nibbled on that conclusion for a while, working it over and over in my mind. I lost myself in my thoughts and the drive. It wasn't that vampires were antithetical to mansions. The vampire design aesthetic was far from chains, skull candles, and black lace. And it wasn't as if Cadogan House was a hovel. It had been elegant before the attack, and it was becoming elegant again. But Navarre House set a new standard for vampire opulence. First, it was tucked into the Gold Coast neighborhood, one of Chicago's ritziest areas, full of gilded-era mansions and celebrity retreats. Second, the interior was awe-inspiring. Giant spaces, weird art, and the kind of furniture you saw in design magazines. The kind of furniture you thought was neat in a museum kind of way, but wouldn't actually want to sit on when watching a game on the flat screen on a Saturday afternoon. Did I mention Navarre had a reception desk? Having parked the Volvo and freshened up as much as possible in the rearview mirror, I went inside and prepared to face the three dark-haired women who controlled access to Navarre and its master. Ethan and I had dubbed them the Three Fates, a la Greek myth because they exercised a similar amount of power. They looked petite, but I had the sense that one false move, or one unauthorized step past the reception desk, and you'd be in trouble. Today they mostly seemed overwhelmed. The house's lobby was swamped with people. None fit into obvious categories. No reporters, no vampires, no one who seemed like a member of McKetrick's crew doing a little in-house surveying. Most wore standard black suits, more of the accountant variety than the Cadogan house variety, and they carried notepads or nondescript black bags. I maneuvered through them to the reception desk and waited until I got the attention of the fate on the left. After a moment, she looked up at me, obviously frazzled, her fingers flying across the keys even as she made eye contact. Yes, she asked. Merritt, Sentinel, Cadogan, here to see Morgan, if he's available. She blew out a breath, finally glanced down at her screen, and continued her marathon typing. A man bumped beside me at the desk and looked down at her. I had an appointment fifteen minutes ago. Nadia is working as quickly as possible, sir. She'll be with you shortly. She pointed a long-fingered nail at the benches behind the desk. Have a seat. The man clearly didn't like her answer, but he bit his tongue and squeezed back through. I leaned forward a bit. What's going on here today? I thought Tate wasn't allowing humans in the houses. She rolled her eyes. He's offered an exception to that rule. We're in the process of selecting our vendors for the next calendar year. The mayor suggested Nadia talk with representatives of the human businesses in town to get their bids. Nadia was the Navarre second, Morgan's vice president. She was also supermodel gorgeous, which was a shocking thing to learn the first time you walked into your ex-boyfriend's abode. The fate cast an unhappy glance out across the crowd. I seriously doubt they can meet our needs. I'd assumed we had a cleaning crew and a ground staff, and I knew one of the house chefs, but it hadn't occurred to me that vampires needed vendors. But someone had to stock the house kitchens, keep folders and highlighters in the ops room, and ensure the crystal decanters in Ethan's office were filled with fine liquor. 
Here, that duty fell to Nadia and a boatload of vendors vying for the privilege of selling their wares. I wondered if Malik did the same thing for Cadogan House, interviewing vendors, considering bids and quotes, and reviewing contracts. It certainly would have made sense. Ethan was the house's chief executive officer, which made Malik its chief operating officer. A blonde with tightly hot-rolled hair and a lot of black eyeliner stepped up to the desk. Is Mr. Greer available? Perhaps I could just speak with him if Nadia is too busy? Expression flat, the fate glanced at me. Do you remember where his office is? I can find my way up, I assured her, walking away to the unhappy squeals of the woman I'd displaced in line. Not that she'd had any chance. I walked across the house's gigantic first floor to the arching staircase that led to the second floor. Morgan's office was there, a modern suite with a garden view. The door was closed so I wrapped my knuckles against it. Come in. I stepped inside and nearly lost my breath. Morgan was half-naked, clad only in black trousers, pulling a short-sleeved white undershirt over his head, the muscles in his stomach clenching and bunching with the effort. When he was clothed, he pulled back his dark shoulder-length hair and tied it at his nape. It wasn't until then that he glanced over at me. Yes. I opened my mouth, then shut it again, having completely forgotten the speech I was prepared to make. Honest to God, my mind was completely blank, all rational thought having fled at the sight of his body. God knew physical attraction was never the problem. Nothing about Morgan was the problem. I was the problem. Ethan was the problem. I had to shake my head to clear it. His expression went smug. I assumed he was happy he'd been able to fluster me. Not expecting company, I finally managed. Morgan sat down on the edge of a chair, pulled on socks, then lifted fancy square-toed shoes from the floor and slid his foot into one. I just finished a workout, and we've got dinner in an hour. What do you need? Realizing I was still standing in the doorway, door askew, I stepped into the room and closed it behind me. I wanted to update you on the investigation. Halfway through the second shoe, his hands stilled, and he looked up at me. That's when I noticed the blue shadows under his eyes. He looked tired. It couldn't have been easy for him to fill Selena's shoes, especially given the unrest. I didn't envy a second forced into the role of a master, and I'd helped put him there. Then by all means, update me. I managed not to roll my eyes and repeated what we'd discovered in Streeterville, what we'd learned at the bar, and what we'd learned from Polly. By the time I was done, Morgan was fully clothed and was sitting back in the chair, fingers linked across his stomach. You came across town to tell me all that? We've identified the guy who's been selling V to vampires. His name is Polly Sermock. I need to know if he looks familiar. Yeah, well, I don't generally hang around with addicts. The attitude wasn't unexpected. That's why I'd asked Jeff for the picture. This was about evidence, not irritation. I pulled out my phone and called up Polly's picture. He's not an addict. He's a salesman, at least as far as I can tell. I walked closer and held out the phone, then watched to make sure he glanced over at it. I'd expected Morgan to roll his eyes and tell me he hadn't seen Sir Mock. I'd expected him to wax sarcastic about my investigation. I hadn't expected the wide-eyed expression. He tensed, his shoulders squaring, his jaw clenching. He knew something. You've seen him, I said, before he could deny it or make his features blank again. But it still took him a minute to answer. Six months ago. Selena never allowed humans in the house, even before Tate issued the mandate. I was on my way up here to talk to her. I don't remember what we were meeting about. He, Sir Mock, was on his way out of the office. I asked her who he was. It was strange that he was in the house. So Selena had met with the man who sold V in her own house. That was all well and good, but it was completely circumstantial. Circumstantial or not, Morgan was clearly flustered, clearly bothered by the links he was beginning to put together. 
Morgan closed his eyes, then scrubbed his hands over his face and linked his hands over his head. It really, really pisses me off when you're right. I don't want to be right, I assured him. I want to be the one with ludicrous theories. I don't want Selena making your job, or mine, harder. He grunted and looked away, not ready to share the details of whatever he knew. I gave him space, walking to the other side of the office where a giant window overlooked a smartly designed courtyard. What did Selena say about him? I asked after a moment. That he was a vendor for the house. And things had come full circle. And as a second, selecting vendors was your job, right? Morgan glanced back and nodded ruefully. That's another reason it was strange that he was here. I just guessed it was a special project. I checked the books. They were fine. All the house funds were accounted for. But there weren't any extra vendors listed. So she hadn't actually gotten anything from him, on the books anyway. Morgan nodded. What else would she want with Polly Sermock? I mean, even if they were in the drug game together, why would she want to be involved in selling drugs to vampires? Does she need money? Morgan shook his head. She gets a stipend from the GP for being a member, and she's been alive for a very long time. Compound interest? Compound interest, he confirmed. No dice there, then. Maybe it's the drug itself, I suggested. Sermok said it stood for veritas, which is Latin for truth. He said it's supposed to make vampires feel more like themselves. Morgan furrowed his brow, considering. Selina has always believed relations between humans and vampires were going to come to a cataclysmic end. She just thought she'd come out on top, which is why she'd work to ingratiate herself to humans, to usher in the end of their reign. He shrugged. Maybe, but as for V, I don't know. If she wanted truer vampires, why not allow Navarre to drink? Because if she'd allowed drinking, I thought, she wouldn't have been able to demonize Cadogan. In any event, we could ferret out her motivations later. Right now, we needed evidence. I stared at the floor for a minute, trying to figure out if I was missing anything but nothing occurred to me as much as I wanted there to be an ultimate answer to all my V-related questions. When I looked up at Morgan again, I found his gaze on me, his expression surprisingly unguarded. What? I asked him. He gave me a flat look, the implication being that he'd been reminded of the affection for me that I didn't share. No time like the present to cut off that train of thought. I should get going, I said. I need to get changed. You bringing a date? Is there ever going to be a time that you don't ask me about Ethan? Only when it stops irritating you to ask. Unlikely to happen. And there you are. We stood there for a moment, and I caught the hint of a smile on his face. If he could manage to work through his anger, I could manage to have a good attitude about it. I headed for the door. You're such a comedian. I try, Merritt. I really do. Good night, Morgan. Only for an hour, he reminded me as I closed the door and walked back to the stairs. When I reached the first floor, the cadre of vendors still stood in the lobby, milling impatiently about as they waited for their turn with Nadia. I hoped they had more patience with the Navarre House staff than I did. When I returned to the house, Ethan and Luke met me at the door. I looked at Ethan, prepared to tell the tale one last time. Frankly, being a proactive sentinel involved repeating the same information over and over and over again. But the tale needed to be told. So I sucked it up and did my duty. Polly Sermock is probably involved in the drug trade, and he's not especially shy about it. He says he's only a bit player. His digs are in pretty bad shape, but there's a shiny vintage Mustang in the garage. I almost filled out the rest, but thought ahead enough to glance at Ethan, a question in my eyes. Could I tell him? Could I implicate a member of the GP after the tongue lashing I'd assumed he'd received from Darius? Or was I putting him in an even worse position? At this point, he said quietly, there's no harm in candor. 
In that case, I went to Navarre House and showed Morgan a picture of Sir Mock. Six months ago, Morgan saw Polly coming out of Selina's office. She called him a vendor. I watched Ethan's expression carefully, and I'm still not sure whether I saw relief or anxiety there. The news was equally bad and good. We had a witness who could link Selina to the man who sold V, but it was Selina. She was hands off as far as the GP was concerned. Luke glanced around warily, then lowered his voice, as if expecting Darius to come waltzing in at any moment, receivership papers in hand. So Selina and Polly are acquaintances, Luke said. That makes it more likely Selina was the Marie seen by the human and the woman in the car. But we can't prove that, Ethan said, tucking his hands into his pockets. And as much as it pains me to say it, that Polly and Selina had a meeting half a year ago doesn't mean she's actively involved in setting up raves or distributing V. And it's unlikely she's going to come forward and offer the evidence on a platter, Luke said. True, I agreed, a plan already forming. Which is precisely why we need to draw her out. Ethan's gaze snapped to me. Draw her out? Prove that Polly and Selina are connected. Use him to get to Selina, to draw her out, and to prove that she's involved in distributing V and organizing the raves to help that endeavor. And how do you propose to do that? Ethan asked. What bait could we offer that would entice Selina? The answer was easy. Me. Silence. You have certainly grown into your position, Ethan dryly said. And your willingness to take risks on behalf of the house. I'm well aware that she can thoroughly kick my ass. That makes it less a risk, if more of an inevitability. You are stronger than the last time you met, he pointed out. You've bested shifters since then. She knocked me out with a single kick to the chest, I pointed out, my ribs aching in sympathy. But that's not the point. For whatever reason, as we've discussed, she's fascinated by me. If Polly tells her I'll be waiting, she'll probably take advantage. Ethan frowned. That is probably true. I have to do it, I told him. We've identified Polly, and we know he's involved with Selena. But we can't close down V, halt the distribution, until we have proof. At least enough evidence to take to Tate. We don't have to take it to the GP, I reminded Ethan. We only need to give Tate enough information to nail Polly and Selena so the CPD can close the loop. If we can't rely on the GP to bring her down, I quietly added, then let's help Tate do it. She has a point, Hoss, Luke quietly agreed. She's our best means to pull Selena out. After a moment, Ethan nodded. Work your plan, Sentinel, he tapped his watch. But first, go get dressed. I only just realized that he was already prepped for dinner in a slim-fit black suit and a narrow black tie. That meant he'd be waiting on me. I'll go change, I agreed. I was also going to head upstairs and use the phone number Jeff had given me to send a message to Polly Sermock. One way or another, I was going to find her. GP be damned. I was going to bring her down. Much to my surprise, I found no dress hanging on my door when I returned upstairs. The last couple of times I'd had to make social appearances with Ethan, he'd given me decadent couture gowns, presumably so I wouldn't embarrass the house with my usual jeans and tank tops. At first, I'd been offended by the gesture. Not even a girl who cut her fangs on denim and pumas could appreciate good design when it presented itself. This time, the door was empty of all but its small bulletin board, and the closet bore only the usual pieces of my wardrobe. Oh well, it was probably for the best. I didn't really have time to be the girl who needed lawn vaughn just to leave the house. Without a new option, I cleaned up and stepped into one of the other dresses Ethan had supplied. It was a knee-length black cocktail dress with a sleeveless bodice and swingy skirt, the fabric tucked into horizontal pleats from top to bottom. I opted for the black heels Ethan had provided with the dress, as well as a holster that went beneath the skirt and held my dagger in place against my thigh. My Cadogan medal was my only accessory, and I left my hair down, 
my bangs a dark fringe across my forehead. When I was made up, I sent a message to Polly Sermock. Tell Marie I'm ready to meet her. The message sent, I slipped the phone into a small black clutch. It was time to go play with the boys. Chapter 18 V is for Valor Ethan was waiting on the first floor by the Newell post and looked up as I stepped onto the final stair. You look lovely. Thank you. I smoothed my hands over the skirt self-consciously. No objection to the fact that I'm wearing this dress again? Ethan's smile was teasing. Don't tell me you were looking forward to receiving another one. That would be ridiculous. I am well above such juvenile concerns. His smile turned a little more philosophical. You like the things you like. You take great joy in those things, and you should never be ashamed of that. The pleasure that you take in simple things, food, clothing, architecture, is a very attractive quality. I looked away from the warmth in his eyes. Are we ready? You have your dagger? I rarely leave home without it. Then to the bat cave, Sentinel. He was in a rare, jovial mood, a mood lighter than I would have expected given the event we were about to attend. Ethan could definitely do formal. He looked good in a tux and knew how to schmooze a crowd. But the audience wasn't likely to be receptive. When we were in the car and buckling our seatbelts, our gazes caught. Do you think McKetrick will attempt to waylay us this time? He snorted and started the car. Given our luck, quite possibly. Fortunately, he was wrong. We made it to Lakeshore Drive without incident other than a nasty snarl that slowed traffic to a crawl. It was late, but that didn't preclude a solid case of gaper's block. The near standstill of traffic caused when drivers slowed to check out a wreck. In this case, there wasn't even a wreck, just a couple of club-going girls who pouted beside their car while a cop wrote up a ticket. We were somewhere near Navy Pier when I broached the topic he hadn't yet. Are you going to tell me about your call with Darius? I decided I'd rather have him punching trees than holding things back. At least with tree punching, I could gauge how much trouble we were in. With silence, I had no clue. It took Ethan a moment to answer. There is no need to get into it. No need to tell your sentinel what the head of the GP thinks about the house? Suffice it to say, he had choice words about my leadership. I glanced over at him. And that's all you're going to tell me? No venting? There are times when politics invade the house. Sometimes it's unavoidable. But my job as a master is to insulate you from those things, not from the consideration of strategy and alliances and the like, but from political pressure from the top. You are to undertake the tasks appropriate to your position, and worrying about my job or Darius's aren't some of those tasks. Thank you. Except it doesn't exactly help me prepare for the inevitable GP kick in the face. He paused. Sometimes you're too smart for your own good, you know. I smiled toothily. It's one of my better qualities. He humped. Well, to spare you the sordid details, he is quite convinced our investigation of the raves is only making the problem worse and drawing more attention to it. He is of the opinion these are matters for the GP to handle, and if and when the GP feels action is appropriate, they will do so. Wow, I sarcastically said. That's not at all short-sighted and naive. Attention to detail has never been Darius's strong suit. Call it the far-sightedness of immortality. He often misses the trees for the forest. Ethan drummed his fingers against the steering wheel. I don't know what to say to convince him otherwise, to make him understand the gravity of the situation. Maybe we should arrange for McKetrick and Darius to have a chat. He chuckled. Not an altogether bad idea, although I'm not sure who'd win, the British bully or the American one. I wonder if four months ago you'd be thinking such things. He slid me a glance. Meaning what, Sentinel? I thought for a moment, trying to figure out how to give voice to the idea. On our good days, I think we make each other better. At our jobs, I mean, I quickly clarified. You remind me of the house, 
of the things we fight for. And you remind me what it's like to be human. I nodded, now feeling a little silly for voicing the sentiment. We are a good pair, he said, and I didn't disagree. We'd reached a detente. We seem to be working well together right now, as if we'd found that delicate balance point between friends and lovers. I didn't want to be one of those girls that became more attracted to things I couldn't have. But that was not really what this was. Against all odds, and every bit of relationship advice handed down by mothers and girlfriends through the centuries, he honestly seemed to be changing. He'd moved from taking advantage of the chemistry between us to wooing me with words, with trust, with respect. That wasn't something I'd expected, but that made it all the more meaningful and frightening. As a girl with good sense, how was I supposed to react to a boy who'd done the unthinkable and actually grown up? It was a hard question. While the thought of our being together was kind of thrilling, I still wasn't ready. Would I be ready eventually? Honestly, I didn't know. But as Ethan had once told me, he had eternity to prove me wrong. He found on-street parking outside Grey House. It was weird to approach the building for the second time in the guise of a dinner guest who'd never seen the inside. I decided to play surprised and impressed, but however I tried to spin it, it was still a lie to Ethan. With a master at my side, I walked back into Grey House. Charlie, Darius's assistant, stood just in front of the lush greenery in the atrium. He wore navy slacks and a khaki blazer, a pale blue shirt beneath. His feet were tucked into loafers, no socks. It was an odd ensemble for August in Chicago, but the formality suited him. Charlie didn't leave his task to the imagination. Darius would like to speak with you. Ethan and I exchanged a glance. Where? he asked. Charlie smiled grandly. Scott has offered up his office. This way, he said, extending an arm. We followed him through the atrium to one of the doors beneath the walkway, one of the rooms Jonah had said was non-essential. He opened the door and waited while we walked inside. The room was gigantic, nearly as large as a football field. It looked like an old warehouse, with well-worn plank floors and painted brick walls, a post and beam ceiling overhead. There were desks sprinkled throughout the space. I guess Scott and his staff shared an office. But if so, they weren't in sight now. Darius sat beside Scott on a low, modern couch. Both of them wore suits. Jonah stood behind him and gave me a small nod of acknowledgement. And then what looked from the corner of my eye like a more lingering glance. I was probably imagining it. But when I involuntarily met his gaze, he looked swiftly away like he'd been caught mid-stare. Like I said, complications. Morgan stood a few feet away, arms crossed over his chest, wearing the shirt and trousers I'd seen him in, and not in, earlier. He glanced up when we walked in, but wouldn't make eye contact. My stomach sank, and I knew exactly what was coming. I risked making telepathic contact with Ethan. Be ready, I told him. I think Morgan told Darius about Polly Sermock. Charlie walked out again and closed the door behind him. Jariah started in as soon as the door was closed. Mr. Greer has advised me that you've been investigating Selena. This time, it was my mental connection with Morgan that I activated. It wasn't a connection we were supposed to have, since he hadn't made me a vampire. But it was handy when he needed a bit of surreptitious berating. I trusted you, I told him. I trusted you with information, and you decided to take it to Darius? He didn't respond, just shook his head. It was the move of a coward, or a child. And it didn't exactly help diminish my own anger. Ethan might have been surprised the last time Darius had gone on the offensive, but this time he was prepared for the onslaught. As you know, sire, we are required by canon to follow the laws and dictates of the city in which we are housed. Mayor Tate required us to investigate the nature of the new raves. We have done so. You have implicated a member of the Presidium. 
We have followed the information where it led. And it led to Selina. Ever so slowly, Ethan turned his frosty gaze on Morgan. I believe Mr. Greer was the vampire who confirmed Selina's relationship with a man believed to be distributing V across the city. Morgan looked back at Ethan, teeth bared, magic suddenly spilling into the room as his anger obviously blossomed. Ethan's reaction was nearly instantaneous. His eyes silvered, his own fangs descended, and his own magic, cooler and crisper than Morgan's, spilled out as well. Ethan took a step forward, menace in his eyes, and me at his back. I'd seen Ethan pissed before, even at Morgan, but never like this. You will remember your place, Ethan said, calling on the fact that he'd been master longer than Morgan had been alive. Hell, I'd been a vampire longer than Morgan had been a master, and that wasn't saying much. But this time, Morgan wasn't swayed. He took a step forward and stabbed a finger in his chest. My place? Mine is the oldest American house, Sullivan. And don't you forget it. And I'm not the one embarrassing all the houses by stirring up drama that doesn't need to be stirred. Are you insane? Ethan asked. Do you understand what's going on out there right now? The trouble? The risks? The houses are facing because of what your former master did? Or because of what she's doing right now? Enough! Darius said, jumping to his feet. Enough of this! You are masters of your houses, and you're acting like children. This conversation is an embarrassment to all American houses and the GP, without whose generosity they would not exist. That was putting it a bit strongly, I thought. As of this instant, you will both begin to comport yourselves like masters, like the princes you are meant to be, not squabbling like human children. Darius looked up, icy eyes drilling into me. Your sentinel is off the streets. She is not to be engaged in any further investigation of whatever issues your mayor imagines to exist. Ethan's eyes could have hardly been wider. And if the warrant for my arrest is executed? Darius's gaze slipped back to Ethan. The mayor of the city of Chicago is surely intelligent enough not to think that a man-made prison can hold you however much he may enjoy using the threat of incarceration to coerce you into solving his problems for him. Those problems are still his to solve. And, more important, have any of you seen evidence that the three girls your mayor believes were killed are actually dead? Have you seen any evidence three girls were missing in Chicago? Catcher had promised he'd look into the girls' deaths, but hadn't passed any information along to me. But just because they hadn't solved the crime didn't mean a crime hadn't been committed. I spoke up. The eyewitness believed that three women were killed, and the things he described were accurate. Vampires who were trigger-happy, doped on violence, ready to fight. In other words, Darius began, his manner supremely smug. Just like vampires? Let it be, Sentinel, echoed Ethan's voice in my head. Battling six hundred years of entrenched belief is not a fight you can win. He's wrong, I protested. That's as may be, but our fight is for Chicago, not Darius West, whatever his power. Fight the fight you can win. For now, he added in classic Ethan style, be still. And the fact that raves are becoming larger and more violent, Ethan asked. Vampires are acting as vampires have always acted. If a few errant vampires break the rules of their home city, let the city respond. And if that's not enough, then the GP will discuss it, and the GP will act. Maintain control over your own house, Ethan, and leave the GP to its work. You are not to consider this issue any further. A heavy silence filled the room. Sire. Scott said, finally speaking up. I'm informed our guests have arrived. As you have presented your directives, perhaps Ethan can acknowledge receipt, and we can move into dinner. Darius tilted his head at Ethan, the move more canine than vampiric. Ethan? Ethan moistened his lips, and I knew he was stalling. Given the spiel he then offered up, I knew why. Sire, 
I acknowledge receipt of your directives and will act as commanded. He might as well have been crossing his fingers behind his back for all the rebellion in his body language. But you couldn't fault his answer. He sounded completely obedient in word and tone. Those words, probably holdovers from some feudal ritual, were enough, for Darius nodded. Let us eat, drink, and be merry. He walked to Ethan, arm extended. In a move similar to the one I'd seen Ethan and Malik make, Ethan extended his arm as well, and they grasped forearms and shared a manly half-hug. Whispering followed, quiet enough that I couldn't make out the words. When the gesture was complete, Ethan and Darius exited the office. Morgan followed, then Scott. I was the last out the door, but I didn't make it very far. Morgan cornered me in the hallway, putting his hand on my arm to stop me. She was my master. I had to tell him. I pulled my arm away. No, I whispered. You didn't have to tell him. You knew we were handling it, that we were investigating. What you apparently had to do was sell me and my house down the river because our relationship didn't work out and you're still pissed about it. His eyes widened, but he didn't comment. I'm done helping you, I told him. We're the ones fighting to keep the houses, the city, together. I thought I could count on you as an ally, which is why I gave you the information. I thought it would help if we were all on the same page. I was obviously wrong about that, because you'd rather act like a stung fourteen-year-old than a grown-up. I'm still a master, he said, puffing out his chest a little. For Navarre, that remains to be seen, because you're letting Selena keep control. And as for me, I leaned forward a little. You're not my master. I walked away, undoubtedly leaking a trail of magic behind me. I'd thought when Morgan took over Navarre that at least we wouldn't have an enemy in place, someone who used people whenever the whim struck her. But as was the case with so many other things since I'd become a vampire, I'd been wrong. Chapter 19 Red, Red Wine our dinner party was assembled in another room accessible through the atrium, a space in the warehouse nearly as large as the joint office had been. This one looked like a room for special events. Tonight, a single rectangular table was set in the middle of the room, a handful of modern-styled chairs surrounding it. Gabriel Keane, head of the North American Central Pack of Shapeshifters, stood beside the table with his wife, Tanya. The masters were already moving toward their chairs, having apparently already offered their introductions, which left the shifters to me. I walked toward them, ignoring the vampire behind me and the others in the room. I wouldn't call Gabriel and Tanya friends, per se, but Gabriel certainly had more foresight than Darius, which I could respect. I understand congratulations are in order, I said, offering them both a smile. Gabriel was as manly as they came, big, brawny, tawny-haired, and honey-eyed, with a love of leather and fine Harleys. But his face beamed with paternal pride. We have a beautiful baby boy at home, he confirmed. We appreciate this sentiment. It was nice of you to join us tonight, I said with a teasing smile. I can't imagine you'd normally prefer vampire company to your newborn sons. Gabriel cast a suspicious glance at Darius and the others. I understood the feeling. There are things in life we need to do, he said, and there are things in life we must do. Although I don't anticipate we'll stay very long. Smiling, Tanya fished a tiny wallet out of her clutch. Who could leave this face for long? She held out a small photo of an admittedly adorable baby in a blue onesie. Gabriel smiled at the sight of the picture. He was clearly smitten. There was a wealth of pride and love in his eyes, but when he raised his gaze to me, I could see the hint of fear behind it. The fear that comes from loving something so much you feel weighted down with it, nearly crushed by it. The fear of potential loss, a potential heartbreak, that you might fail the thing you worked so hard to bring into the world. Parental fear, I suppose made worse by the fact that being leader, Apex, of the pack, was hereditary. Connor was born a prince among wolves. He'd been born beneath a mantle of power, 
but also bearing the mantle of a responsibility he couldn't even begin to fathom. It must have been a lot for Gabriel to bear, knowing the responsibility he'd one day hoist upon his child's shoulders. You'll do right by him, I whispered. I wasn't sure if the words were elegant enough, but they seemed right enough, and Gabriel's small nod told me I'd said just the right thing. How are things otherwise? Well, we aren't being used to scientific experiments, Gabriel said dryly. That's a small victory. One of his concerns about announcing Shifter's existence to the world was the fear they'd become fodder for military or medical research. The kinds of things you saw in monster movies and horror flicks. It wasn't exactly a pleasant thought, and I was glad to hear it hadn't come to pass. It's not that I think humans don't believe we're threats, he added. They just aren't entirely sure what to do with us. Shifters were generally considered the most powerful supernatural beings, at least of the groups I knew about so far. I considered humans' ignorance on that point a benefit. And the shifters who attacked the house? His expression darkened. They're working their way through the penal system, just like any average human criminal. While I grimaced, Scott clapped his hands together. Welcome all to Grey House. I appreciate your attendance here, and hope this can be a step toward friendship among us. Shall we dine? Before we could answer, men and women in chef's whites began pouring into the room, bearing silver dome top trays. I took a seat beside Ethan as the trays were deposited before us. Two vampires traveled around the table with carafes of lemon water and bottles of a deep red wine pouring as the vampires requested. Only Ethan, Jonah, and I opted for the wine. I guess we needed a drink worse than the others. Other vampires lifted the domes, revealing the meal that might have been described as Predator's Delight. Loins, roasts, cutlets, sausages, steaks, fillets, all laid out with artistic perfection. Oh, to be sure, there were sides as well. Small fingerling potatoes, corn, and a grain salad of some kind. But in a room of vamps and shifters, predators among humans, the carnivorous urge was undeniable. My stomach chose that moment to growl in a rumble that nearly echoed across the room. As my cheeks heated, all eyes turned to me. I smiled lightly. Gabriel smiled back, then lifted his water glass when the chefs disappeared from the room again. Thank you, Mr. Gray, for the opportunity to share grain and beast with you. This is a meaningful gesture to us, and we hope our families can continue to commune in peace in the years to come. Hear, hear, Darius said, raising his glass as well. We are now neighbors in this fine city, and we hope that our days of strife are behind us and that we can work together in peace and allegiance for millennia to come. Gabriel offered a polite nod and gestured with his glass again, but didn't exactly commit to the allegiance bit. Vamps collected formal allegiances like baseball cards. Shifters weren't exactly crazy about that kind of thing. And since I'd truly rather merit focus on her meal than me, Gabriel said with a wink, let's stop talking and start eating. But, of course, that would have been much too simple. I don't know why it surprised me that Scott offered up a mean feast. The man loved the cubs. He had an amazing warehouse-turned-house, and Benson's was his house bar. Those facts screamed, quality master. The food was no exception. The meats were choice cuts that even my particular father might have served to dinner guests. They were tender enough to make a knife irrelevant and seared to perfection on the outside. He couldn't have done better, especially for a group of predators. Honestly, if I'd been a guy, I would have finished my plate, relaxed in my chair, and unfastened the top button of my pants. Food that good deserved undisturbed digestion. Unfortunately, it wasn't to be. I'd just taken another sip of wine, grimacing at how dry it was, when the door at one end of the room burst open five vampires rushed in, some in black street clothes, but a couple wearing blue and yellow hockey-style jerseys with gray house and capital letters across the front. They all had swords in hand and malice in their expressions. This is how you treat us? 
asked one Greyhouse vamp who wore number 32. Some fucking shifter and his bitch get fed like kings? The Greyhouse vamp on the other side wore number 27. And the GP too? Shit is falling down here in the States, and we're serving steak to a vamp from the UK? Does that seem right to you? Within seconds, my dagger was in hand, and I wasn't the only one on alert. Scott Gray jumped out of his chair and marched to the end of the table. Matt, Drew, back the fuck off. Drop the swords and march right back to the door. The Greyhouse vamps wavered, probably the result of some mental master juju Scott was throwing their way. But the rest of them didn't seem to be affected at all. I carefully got to my feet and moved toward them, spinning the dagger on my palm as the anticipation built. All five vamps wobbled a little on their feet, their movements erratic, their eyes darting around the room. As I moved incrementally closer, I could see the cause in their eyes. They were almost wholly silver. Scott, it's V, I warned him. An easy solution for handling them, he called back. Not without a sorcerer, I told him. We'll have to knock him out the old-fashioned way. Then that's what we'll do. Ethan said, stepping beside me, a knife from the table in his hand. Nice of you to join us, Sullivan, I teased, my gaze following the vamps as they spread out in a line, ready to rumble, whatever the cost. And with Darius, an apex, and three masters in the room, the cost would be high. Let's go, old man, 32 said. You want to fight your own vampires? You want to take his side over theirs? Liege, Jonas said, as your captain, I'm going to request you move into a safer position. Request it all you want, Red, Scott told him, a mirthless smile on his face. But that's not going to stop me from putting these dumb shits in their place. That's what they get for doing V. Ditto what he said, Sentinel, Ethan silently told me. I suppose he wasn't going to let me argue he should just sit this one out. The Greyhouse vamp seemed equally eager to brawl. Oh, go to hell, man, 27 said. Only if you join me, Scott said pleasantly, and before another second passed, the room erupted into violence. Jonah and Scott took the Greyhouse vamps. Gabriel, Darius, and Tanya were sitting this one out. That left the rogues to me, Ethan, and Morgan. I got the one in the middle, I called out. That leaves the other two for us, Ethan said. Greer, take the one on the left. And with that, we moved. I slipped between the in-house squabble to the angry-looking rogue behind him, his eyes just as silver as the gray vamps had been. He was a big guy, and beads of sweat formed at his temple as he fought the rush of the drug. But this guy didn't care whether it was the rage or drugs fueling his attack. He bared his teeth and moved in. I had to give him credit. He was faster than I would have imagined, given his bulk. He moved like a spider, his weight carried delicately on small, mincing feet. He slashed, stepping into the movement like a trained fighter. I blocked the knife with my dagger, but miscalculated his speed and felt the cold burn of pain on the back of my hand. My own blood scented the air, pushing my vampiric instincts into overdrive. I glanced down and saw the thin line of crimson, only a couple of inches long and not terribly deep. It was a glancing blow, but that didn't ease the burn. Not cool, I said, moving into a spin, the dagger in my hand slicing through the front of his shirt. He muttered a few choice phrases but jumped back again. I stayed on the offensive, my intent.